Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Do You Know the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Moklover, and right now we need to talk about the Black Hydra. Commissar Vyacheslav Dmitriev stared at his, at his mouth agape at the photos before him. Pictures of pro Black League pamphlets, posters with their emblem, and books by Karavishev and his generals piled up on the desk. He had never seen so many traitorous materials from a unit like the 40th. 7th Nizhny Tagil Battalion in its entire career. Just three months ago, it was ranked as one of the most loyal units available. How could this have happened? The door to his office opened, and a man wearing the uniform of the military police entered the room. Comrade Komasar, the policeman saluted. We found the prime suspect for the ultra-nationalist case. He seems to have had direct ties to Omsk, and that helped him spread his reactionary propaganda amongst the ranks. Who was he, Komasar Dmitriev asked. He was one of the new transfers from last month. His name is Anatoly Morozov. We were going to arrest him, however. He escaped and is still at large. Start a manhunt, the commissar said, and get me the officers responsible for transferring him. We cannot let disasters like this happen again. Reactionism. It's like a hydra. Cut off one head, and two more will grow in its place. Treasures of the past. Ivan uncapped his pen with his teeth and held a map to his leg so he could mark it while Arkady caught his breath. Another looted warehouse. It seemed that there were a lot of would-be looters in Svetlovsk since the moratorium on scavenging was lifted. You stupid dude, Arkady heaved. That last cell nearly killed me. I don't care what your brother says anymore. We're going back. No, hold on, Ivan said, the cap still in his teeth. He put his pen away and scanned over the map. His brother was in the military and had promised him a hefty reward if he found anything worthwhile. Arkady looked at him intensely. There's another building not far from here. It may be a warehouse. Arkady's grimace didn't budge. Ivan folded up the map and put it in his back pocket. It's all downhill, old man. You can do it. The building was a communal cabin for soldiers or travelers heading north to stop and rest for a day or two. Ivan smashed the lock with a stone and pushed the door in. Both of their eyes widened. The cabin was filled with glass jugs of water and crates of MREs. Annotated maps of the WSPR and even Russia west of the Urals covered the walls. There was a small table next to the cot on the other side of the cabin that was covered in boxes of bullets. A few rifles leaned against the table. Christ, it's a gold mine, Arkady said. His voice weak with surprise. Who put all this here? Doesn't matter, old man, Ivan said, pulling out his map. We're about to make a certain brother of mine very, very happy. We lost riches, hidden in plain sight, and we get quite a few rifles and support equipment. Pretty good. New cells. Privates Fedorov, Meknikov, and Nurotyev. For your formation of an illegal Black League cell and dissemination of its propaganda in the 4th Perolovsk Battalion, the court martial finds you guilty and sentences you to execution by firing squad. Commissar Alexei's verdict was final. The three privates, standing behind a table filled with pieces of Black League propaganda, nodded in acceptance of the sentence and were escorted by guards back to their cells. As Alexei left the courtroom, he was stopped by his superior, Divisional Commander Kalashnik, who led him into an office. Comrade Alexei, there's something I need to show you, he said, gesturing to a map of the country. A rough circle of black pins thrown in Svedlovsk, itself like a ring of dark fire, edging ever closer to it. Each pin is a known Black League cell, Kalashnik explained, seeing Alexei's eyes widen. He continued, I see you understand the problem with your little friends now. Closest to Svedlovsk, and pointed like a dagger at heart, was the Pervoralsk cell, and Fourth Martial Law now, or attempt to infiltrate. Lost treasures, Darn Army Command, Lieutenant Chernyshevsky, swore beneath his breath. This is the third time this month where they sent us on a wild goose chase. The 45th Logistical Platoon was sent to the small village of Montigny to investigate a report that a police station with armory was still standing there, possibly even containing weapons of use to the army, however. After hours of marching, the most they could find in the ruined concrete building were discarded pieces of trash, rubble, and other miscellaneous refuse. Chen Chivinsky began to open his mouth to give the order to return home when a voice called out from the back of the building. I think there's something here, sir. It was Private Solyevov, who was recently listed in the unit. He was staring at a piece of wood near the top of the wall before beginning to pull away the pile of rubble covering it. More men joined him until the pile was removed and standing before them was a door. Cautiously, he opened it. They crept down the cellar or the stairway behind it until they found themselves in a musty cellar. As another private shone a light at the walls, the soldiers stood silent in awe of what they found. Entire shelves of SMGs, old rifles and carbines, boxes of pistols and ammo, enough to supply an entire army once they were taken aback. Or taken back to, of course, HQ. Perseverance pays off. We get 434 units of early infantry rifles, 65 units of support equipment, and a whole treasure. That's pretty darn good. But, as I might have said earlier, I hope you guys are having a pretty good old day. Um, right now, we still need to crack down on that Black League. And hopefully we can form the West Siberian Military District in this episode. It might be really difficult, but we'll see what happens. But we might want more treasure as well. So now people might want to beat us up again, like yesterday, in which a certain dude died. But it is what it is. And right now, oh, we're not doing a national focus. Oh, that's true. We're still trying to get to the AA line, but infiltration efforts. I swear, Comrade Kumasal, we were framed. I don't know what the Black League pamphlets were doing in our lockers. I've heard that one so many times, he said to the rest, 
to the rest of privates as they were escorted away from the barracks. He took out a flask of vodka and drank. All these arrests are getting to you, comrade? His aide laughed. Ah, oh, yeah, a bit, Sorokin said, putting his flask away. Ever since they hired agents to infiltrate the Black League cells, the military police were raking in intelligence about their activities, like a gambler at a casino. They discovered that there were far more cells than they previously knew about was disconcerting. But now their existence was known, it made cracking down on them all the easier. HQ didn't even know about the cell's existence before Agent Politov sent in a number of intelligence reports on communication between them and one in a neighboring village. Sorokin checked his notebook. They still had another cell to arrest before the day was done. Excellent. But it is 63, so we're getting very, very close to the point where uh, it's probably lagging to the point where the civil war is going to spawn for the German nation. Cool. Couple comments though. Uh, this, okay, so with this nation, uh, actually that went by really fast. Um, we can either eventually go with the guy's name who I was I mispronounced last episode. Is it Batov? Is it I use I said the last episode Batov, but Batov. I'm not really sure how the pronunciation works. So if you could write it down in the comments for me, so I miss. Do not mispronounce it anymore. Please let me know. I'm going to just probably for the rest of this episode call it Batov. Batov. No. Batov. Pavel Batov. Like Bukharin. Cool. There's emphasis on different parts of each, uh, you know, spelling and word. So, anyways. And we're still waiting for this one. I keep forgetting that we can't just check it. So, let's crack down and do some more comments. So, there's a lot of support for me to do Pavel Batov as well as Yeltsin. So, we'll see about Yeltsin, but... Uh, let's see. I don't think this is one is really unique to us. If you like to read about this, please go right ahead. Clear skies, dark clouds, things are going to go a little crazy here. And the Reich's frontier can no longer hold. Very nice. And now we can do a Southern Morning, which I think I read yesterday. So if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. As well as this one, too. Cool. And now we lost all that 10 political power. Increased factions are gone. Oh, across the tundra. Oh, I haven't seen this one before. Uh, the publication of a travelogue by the American Stephen Smith has drawn considerable interest both domestically as well as worldwide, with the man outpacing supply by a wide margin. Smith's book, Cross the Tundra, consists of a curated collection of journal writings, narrations of photographs of the people, experiences and locations encountered during this long journey across the entirety of Russia from the Far East to Finland, providing what more than one reviewer had called a fascinating window into the tumultuous political situation of modern Russia. Its publication has resulted in considerable public interest regarding humanitarian conditions and efforts within many of the less fortunate Russian successor states with officials in multiple countries calling for more attention to be dedicated to the provi provisions of such humanitarian aid. Or right, time to order a copy. Cool. And actually, here, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and grab some more piercing. We're going to need to get some armor. But, expansion in Africa, very nice. The world is falling apart, as normal. But a lot of people do want me to play as Yeltsin as well. And someone also said that if you play as Yeltsin, get really kind of intoxicated. We'll see. Maybe someday I'll do a live stream of uh, us playing TNO, and I'll be playing as Yeltsin. And every time... We advance here, I take a drink. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Another comment was, yeah, the correct pronunciation of a Batov, or Batov. I don't know. I mispronounce things a lot of the time. And, ah, uh, people have risen up. Very cool. And I wonder what the next thing is. Old tools for a new world. Captain Valentin Markov's eyes widened as he saw the piles upon piles of crates being unloaded from the old truck. They filled the back from bottom to ceiling and paced, uh, packed it from back to front. The captain nodded. Oh, no, no. There are more on the way from the old armory, Lieutenant Popov said. We'll give the rest of the logistic battalion staff for inspection, but before we w want to do a preliminary check on these things... The captain nodded as a pair of men lowered one of the crates under the ground and opened it with a crowbar. Markov picked up an old PPS-41 from it. His jaw dropped and the smooth, dry stock of the gun and the gleaming metal barrel could have been made yesterday. He looked at the mechanism. It looked like it had just been brought out of the factory. Let me test it out. Do you have any ammo, Lieutenant? Yes, Captain, let me check, said Lieutenant, answering, gazing into the crate before finding a box stock and handing it to Markov, who took some bullets from his ammo pouch and loaded the gun who pulled the trigger. It roared alive, firing the bullets within seconds high into the air. That was a good enough test for him. Setting the gun down, he extended the hand to Lieutenant Popov. Excellent flying, Lieutenant. More basic infantry rifles. Not early, but basic infantry rifles. Support equipment and APCs. That's pretty good. Let's get some more equipment, shall we? Ah, no, no one wants to raid us, hopefully. Actually, uh, let's take a look at equipment real quick. Just because I know it's not very good. We definitely need to get, need to get more anti-tank here. And we're actually doing okay on infantry equipment. That's pretty nice. We need more artillery, of course. And it looks like we've just made another division. An actually relatively decent division. With enough piercing, hopefully, for enemy vehicles. Ooh. They have medium influence right now, which is actually not too bad. That's actually not too bad. But I really wonder what's, what's after this part of the focus tree. Kind of interested. And Ku in Norway. I think I played as Norway before, so. Cool. And the truth. Officers Golki and Borodin stood in the abandoned warehouse as their flashlights lighting up nothing but rubble. According to the information given by Agent Politov, or Politov, 
A Black League cell was supposed to be meeting here 30 minutes ago to meet an agent from Omsk who would give him additional propaganda materials and instructions. What happened? Gorky asked his comrade. They must have found out about us and scrammed, Borodin said, swearing under his breath as he pulled out a radio from his coat pocket. All radio HQ stake out a failure. Meanwhile, Poltov sat from his barracks room. The message to base was sent and all he needed was a reply. Looking at the clock, he too pulled out a tiny radio from his pocket and turned it on. The beep signaling the coming of his instructions came exactly on time and soon an artificial female voice began calling out a series of numbers. He pulled out a notebook and began to to say for the broadcast. Congratulations, Agent Morozov, for your successful false information leak, the message said. The great trial draws a day closer thanks to your efforts. Here are your weekly instructions. The devil is always the last person you expect. And a missed alarm. Sasha Kornilova's eyes snapped open as the sunlight hit them. In a panic, she jumped out of bed and practically threw herself to her dresser, collecting the clothes she would wear today. A glance at the clock had her in her shock of her all of her own. It was almost noon. She had never been able to sleep in so late before. The bombs had been her alarm since she was such a young girl. She That thought brought Sasha to a halt. In her panic at sleeping in, she had noticed a strange silence that existed in the city. With caution, she had opened her window and looked out into the sky. Nothing. The usual rumble of the German bombers was absent. Instead, the skies were clear of any noise. Of course. She expected the bombers to return later in the day, but for now, she would enjoy the peace at least once she got to work. The hours stretched by, and still the bombers did not come. In the evening, Sasha was able to enjoy her walk back to her apartment. The cool Siberian air soothing the eggs that she accrued in the factory. Sasha ate a lonely dinner, dinner and listened to the radio official, official radio broadcast reports all across Svedlovsk territory that the skies are quiet. The report says that for the first time in years, free aviators had no reason to leave the runways. At last, as Sasha lay down in her bed, she reached over and set her alarm for, on the old clock for the first time in her life. A silent night. Beautiful, and our work begins. For the better or worse, the bombers have disappeared. The silence is more deafening than any explosion ever could be. Already, our foes are working to fill that silence with the sounds of labor and war warfare, and we must not, must not let this go to waste, and we must use this opportunity to rebuild and expand. Svedlos can no longer afford to keep its head down to do damage control. Instead, it must be reorganized into a state ready for not only the reunification of the lands of the former West Siberian People's Republic, but Russia as a whole. We must empty the sandbags, retire the socialites, and send the anti-aircraft gunners back to the factories. The road ahead is long, and there's much work to be done. Great. Uh, deal with Dragunov. We get infantry rifles, by arms, eh. The Savant High Command. I do like that. The Svedlovsk Design Bureau, I like that as well. And the Internal Enemies, the Insanity of Yazov, the Tyranny of Kaganovich, Recon Groups, versus the Creation of a New Security State. That's not bad. Knowledge is everything, that's very true. Inspect weaponry, small arms, more production costs, but more, way more liability and lack of resources penalty. Combine arms operations, or we do over here, training time, planning speed. I do kind of like this stuff. This doesn't last all, no, this doesn't last all game, but it doesn't really matter too much. Batov's graceful attack. It's not bad. Brilliant defense. Ooh, I think we want to rush down this way. Let's definitely rush down this way just in case. Intense teamwork training. That's not bad. So, Savant High Command. Svedlovsk possesses some of the most talented commanders have ever walked the earth. Rokosovsk himself, Pavel Batov, Yakov Kreiser, and Ivan Bagremyan are but a few of the journals under our command. Each one brings their own skills and a speciality to the table, but together they form the backbone of not only the Third Army, but Svedlovsk itself. We can use their extensive knowledge of the battlefield to implement wide-reaching reforms in our military, everything from how best to wield a bayonet, to draw upon plans for the front-wide offensive preparations. Very good. We can buy more equipment, but now we're okay. Oh, we can raid these guys. They raided us last, and that kind of, you know, made me a little upset. But let's leave them alone for now. I'd much rather do uh, you good if possible. And let us raid them, please. Simple treasure. Hey, Lebedov, can you shine a light here? Private Smirnov squinted in the dark, trying to make out what the crates in the darkness were seconds later. A bright beam shone in his face. Smirnov blinked before taking out a crowbar, according to HQ. This old building used to be an armory, and it was a task of him and the rest of the logistic platoon to scour the building for any provisions that could be of any use to the army. The soldier finished pulling off the lid. He and another comrade lifted it off and looked inside, pulling out a pair of dusty cocky jackets, pre-war obviously, and smelling a bit musty but in good condition. Smirnov wrapped the one he took around himself, quite warm too. Whoever sealed these uniforms and knew what he was doing? Food! A food from the other squad came ringing out in the darkness of the armory. Smirnov and the rest of the squad ran across the storeroom floor, their boots pounding on the concrete floor as they made their way to the voice. As they looked at the crate, they opened their eyes wide and like Aladdin finding the cave of magical treasures. But to Smirnov and the rest of the platoon, the packs and tr packs of canned food inside were far more valuable. Get more. Oh, we get more anti tank. Yes, please! And more rifles. Great. I love it. More rifles, please. And it's, but especially this stuff. Oh, we got more than enough here. Eh, it could be better, but anti tank. Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I'll be honest. As you can tell, I'm a little worried about enemy tanks, just because we don't really have a lot of anti tank and we can't pierce them too well. But not bad. 
<sighs> this could be a lot worse. We do have, what, five divisions? Six divisions? I do want to throw some anti-tank on here, but we don't have enough anti-tank yet. Caught red-handed. Chuganov, what can you tell us about the <clears throat> Black League's activities in Svevlosk? Officer Plotnikov stood in front of a young man in a chair the other side of the desk. As outside, another guard stood watch in the event the prisoner attempted to escape. The previous morning, Chuganov was caught by the border police trying to bypass the security checks. While he claimed he was from Tumian, certain papers on his person suggested otherwise. I told you I have nothing to do with those freaks. My parents live in Svedlosk. I just wanted to see. A convincing story, Plotnikov said. If I weren't for the papers we confiscated, maybe we could even have believed you, Chuganov, or should we say Medvedev? Plotnikov held up a tiny notebook, holding it close to his face as he began to read. It says here you were supposed to rendezvous with a Black League cell in an abandoned factory outside Kamensk, Medvedev. Can you tell us a little bit more about this group of yours? Medvedev sighed, realizing his game was up. What do you want to know about them? He said to the officer before to him. Everything. I want to keep going down this way. Sometimes I question whether it's really, really good to go down this path. Because this one is okay, but then you do get organization. And you could always instead do more, like, gun stuff. We could really do more gun stuff. But, I command. We're going to race for that down there, the sound skies. At long last, the skies are clear. Oh, thanks to Marshal Rokosovsky's great efforts to protect the people and actively deter the Nazis. The bombers have disappeared and our people are free from the claws of the Luftwaffe. This is a cause for celebration, but we must not be idle. There is much work to be done to prepare Svedlovsk for the reclamation of Russia. We cannot afford to waste time. Our industries and infrastructure must not only be repaired, but upgraded. Our military must be re-equipped and strengthened, and we must investigate our rivals in the region. So we know what we're up against. It's time to come out of hiding and let's get to work. Wow, that's great! We get more manpower, a lot more... Quite a bit more political power and stability war support. Sign us up, even though we're already max amount of stability right now. Which is, eh, you know, it could be worse. And actually, we have nothing here, too. Huh. We actually have a surplus of PP. This is unusual. But let's go ahead and grab this one as fast as possible. Specialized forces. Svedlovsk military is like a hammer. It's strong and able to effectively utilize force, but has none of the finesse needed for special operations. Currently, this has made covert operations, such as infiltration, essentially impossible. Creating a new special forces branch of the military will allow us to fight in more rigorous fighting conditions, engage in multiple types of warfare, and launch new kinds of missions. Which is not bad. Special forces attack and defense. Eh, that stuff is okay for a year. I'm not really too worried about that. So we'll see what happens. Crack them down. Yes. Let's get them some more loot. Kaiser's brilliant defense. Comrade Kaiser is one of the finest generals in all of Russia, having served with a distinction in the Second World War. He is known for his tactical skill and when on the defensive, and after nearly two decades of continuous warfare, he has returned defending into an art. His methods can make heavy use of mobile fortifications that can change positions to counter enemy attacks on a whim and perform lightning-fast retreats when needed. His methods are to become a main staple of our military doctrine, post-haste. The least. Oh, Colonel Smirnov looked at the old Thompson submachine gun he held it in his hands, then to the truck being unloaded with crates of weaponry. A logistical platoon just returned from an old army base loaded with arms and equipment, just to arm enough to arm hundreds of soldiers if they were an American land lease weapons from the Great Patriotic War. What a shame that not only were these imported American weapons from the war, but that boxes of ammo they found were all rusted. He walked towards the truck until he found a man with a gunsmith's insignia on his uniform and began to speak. How long will it take to rechamber one of these guns for our Tokarov rounds? We'll have to get uh, more rechambers from Svedlos, the gunsmith said, but once we've received them, it should be a relatively easy task. Smirnov looked at the road once more. The stack of unloaded crates looked like an ancient pyramid. Such was its height. The unit will pay for requisition and transportation costs. Tell, me, tell your men that they'll be very busy for the, in the coming weeks. We get... We don't get SMGs or guns. We get early main battle tanks, IFEs, and APCs? Hey, don't get me wrong. I'll take it, but that seems a bit weird. But we'll take it. We'll gladly take it. Victories in the Silence of War. The internal security bureau is at war, and this war has presented them with a unique challenge. The enemy combatants wear no uniforms, bear no armbands or symbols on their persons. They do not wield rifles and knives against us, or weapons of choice or books, pamphlets, and propaganda in this war. Battles are fought and won in the minds of soldiers, not the battlefield. So basically, this is, we read this thing yesterday about um, two men. If you'd like to read this again, this last paragraph, please go ahead. We should not rest until the rest of their black blood has, not, has been purged from our lands. Good. Inferno. Anatoly Morozov heard a police sniper's bullet ricochet against a metal staircase as he rushed ever higher, climbing the steps to the top of the warehouse. He was the last surviving member of his cell, the last hope that Svedlos could join the ranks of the Black League in the great trial that hallowed day came. But the one voice called out, Anatoly Morozov, do not resist arrest. He ignored the military police officer officer's words. As he climbed to the top of the structure, old tanks of gasoline surrounded him on the roof. Beneath him, he could see a gathered platoon of military police, with a chief speaking out to him with a loudspeaker. This is your last chance, Morozov. Surrender now, or we will open fire. 
No morals off. That is a gaze at the tank beside him. There could be no surrender. If he could not take part in the great trial, there was no purpose to his life. A police sniper's tracer bullet missed him, missed, missed him and hit a gas tank beside him, catching fire. He began to smile as he opened the faucets of the tanks around him, crazing a blaze. Russia shouted eyes. He shouted, arms stretched, outstretched, laughing triumphantly as he opened, truly completed his escape from the police and the fiery blast of the exploding tanks consuming his body. Top of the world. Top of the morning to you, laddies. Well, he's gone. At least we don't have to deal with him anymore, probably. Unless he's like Jesus Christ's brother and he reincarnates himself, but probably not. Probably not this part of Russia. Cool. And we're almost there. And we do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and toasty. Rush defense. We want as much defense as possible, man. Alright, what can we do here? Uh, what's going on here? Orochia, that's cool. Scavenge for loot. I'd like to raid people, but we'll see what happens. Let's go into Svedlovsk Design Bureau to get our research facilities pumping. Strengthening our technological ability will assist greatly in our efforts to renovate the army and build up our economic strength. Following the Second World War and the collapse of Russia and the subsequent German or Soviet German War, Svedlovsk has found itself in possession of several formerly Soviet scientists. Many of these scientists have come to us offering their services. Creating a new bureau to manage these scientists and build research facilities to house and employ them would be quite a boon for our research and development teams. Absolutely. And quite a bit of lag, but that's alright. Hey, there we go. Agriculture methods, thank you. West Siberian dudes. Well, a lot of this is over river. 39 divisions, that's not too bad. Uh, they got a lot of manpower just like us, so... Hey! Uh, hello there! Alright, so since we're here... Anti-tank looks really bad. I'm just gonna do this anyways. It helps prevent... Um, that's, oh, actually, that's only minus 40. Yeah, that's not too bad, actually. Let's do that one, because everyone needs that stuff here. Do we have enough support equipment for this? There you go! Not bad! Go ahead and train. Go ahead and train. I'm fine with that, actually. I forget what I was going to say, but whatever. It doesn't really matter. Anything else? Oh, we can raid those guys. You grab... Does not have stuff. Dang it. Um, deal with Dragunov. A guarantee for arms. No compromise. Not a aggression pact. Integration. We get more fuel. Uh, intense teamwork training, more division training time, training penalty reduction, the path of the least bloodshed. That's not bad, I like that one too. Let's go with the intensified training regimen. But old bird, Private Krupin shot a light into the abandoned hangar. As the mission HQ had informed them, there was still a number of old planes from the last days of the Great Patriotic War. The question was how many of them still functioned, if any. He and his squad walked down the aisle, their sister squad in a different aisle, checking the condition of each plane in turn. Much to their disappointment, most of them, like the first plane, were rusted beyond repair, their internal parts perhaps being useful for scrap. That's when they found the old Elysian, L2, attack plane. Like its sisters, much of the paint had worn away over the years, but the cockpit looked okay and the other external parts, though obviously out of maintenance, seemed more functional. There was only one way to test the plane. You were the one in the Air Force, comrade, Sergeant Ibragamov said, raising Krupin. The private nodded, opened the cockpit, and entered the plane. The controls looked a little worn, but still functional. Performing the startup sequence from memory, his face grew into a grin and his comrades began to cheer. After years of dormancy, the old plane's engine sputtered to life once again. We uh, take to the skies. Great. Er, interceptors, fighters, bombers? Great. If our army is to reunify Russia, we will need to transform it into a truly professional fighting force. On account of this fact, the army will need to completely revise its training regimens and rework its boot camps from the ground up to accommodate our new higher standards. Our recruits will need to be able to fight just as well in the severe conditions of the Ural Mountains, here in the north, as well as the Rin Deserts to the south. While many recruits we previously would have accepted to be turned away, what's left of the cream of the crop. More training time and more planning speed. Eh, I don't mind the planning speed, but it doesn't really mean too much to me. Of course, we have no loot as well for now, so it is what it is. How are we doing with social stuff? Quite well, especially on equipment. Look at that. That's pretty good. Followed up. I wonder when it's just going to explode here. Batov's graceful attack. Siberia is a land of vast forests, wide rivers, and towering mountains, none of which deter General Pavel Batov. Comrade Batov is a close friend of Rokosovsky and is second in command, and for good reason. His skills in traversing both hostile terrain to outflank and encircle enemy forces, coupled with his expertise in launching offensive operations across rivers, will make him a formidable commander. I, I think I see why he's across rivers here. We shall study and perfect his tactics so they may replica be replicated throughout the entire army. Just because of the river thing, I was looking up uh, Batov quite a bit, and it's like the last little battle in Germany in 45. He had to cross a difficult river, and he obviously won, but river crossings are not, not always easy to do. Then again, I've never joined the military, so. But it's always interesting to read about historical figures. Actually, what is our stockpile like? We need more anti-tank. We need more guns now, actually, which kind of sucks, but that's okay. Land doctrine is important, as well as intense teamwork training. An army is an organism. It has countless microscopic parts that all work in unison to accomplish a shared objective. We can improve the effectiveness of the organism by turning each individual squad into a microcosm of it. 
Soldiers are to be trained extensively in squad tactics that emphasize teamwork, flexibility, and effectiveness. They must be beholden not to our government or some lofty philosophical philosophical goal, but to their brothers in arms, who thick and thin. I mean, we should lose some research speed, but that's okay with us. That's fine. Let's get some better guns first. Actually, land attack would be really good, but getting better guns is probably kind of important. Let's get for loot. That'll be good. People might want to try to raid us, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Artillery is not looking good either. Honestly, oh, support equipment is actually not doing too bad. What happened down here in Africa? Well, looks like, wow, that really sucks for America. Hey, but the Jews won in Madagascar. Very cool. Wow, up to 30, 30, 30, 30 54 divisions. And let's sell by Nixon for now. He's probably going to leave very soon. Oh, hello. What's going on down to men and Omsk? All right. And let's see what happened. Well, they might have lost their stuff, but that's okay. Nice. Very good. And the path of least bloodshed. In the vast west of Siberia, flesh is the most valuable resource. Soldiers, skilled or otherwise, are scarce at the moment. And we must amend our tactics to reflect that. Whether on the offensive or defensive, time must be taken to establish field hospitals, and squads should develop strategies for extracting their wounded comrades so they may live to fight another day. The path of least bloodshed is the one upon which we find victory. Get even more attrition speed and defense, which I love that defense. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And we do have seven divisions, which is actually pretty darn good. Oh, let's do that. Raise it up and have some coffee, maybe. Ah, finally, Yugra. Yes, daddy. All we need to do is love to these two, which is not too bad. Into the woods. But let's do this one first. Luke, a uh, Fedosov's version of teamwork training was part was team sports. Sergeant Kutuzov's version of teamwork with training was dumping Luka and either and eight other men into the squad into the woods in the dead of night with nothing more than a few basic survival tools and the pajamas on their backs, and telling them to navigate back to base, cooperation, even on the squad level, is a hallmark of victory, he'd say. He clearly didn't take Yuli Listitsin into account. Yuli made his opinion known no matter what, and most of the time his opinion was an insult. Luka had hoped he would ease off given their circumstances. Even Piotr, or Pieter, Luka's squad leader, told Yuli to zip it Unfortunately, Snark doesn't require a full night's rest. Maybe you can't start a fire by starting, staring at it. Uh, Fedosov. Maybe you can help me read the map, Fedosov. You must have night vision since you clearly don't want to start that fire. I'll cut kindling as well as you cut your hand. We'll be back at base by now. Or if you cut it. No. Eventually, Luca got the star fire started. Yuli figured out wha where they were until Luca's surprise thanked him. Luca joked that he wasn't sure Yuli could read, and they both laughed. They set off, and after traversing several lethal inclines and fording a river, they arrived back at base shortly after sunrise. Luca was dirty, soaked from the waist down, and cut on both hands. When Kutusov saw them marching back to the barracks, the only thing he said was, What the heck happened to you? Yuli smirked and asked Kutusov if he saw something he liked. Luca and the rest of the squad chuckled. Camaraderie forged in trying times is the strongest bond. Cool. Let's beat the crap out of them, because we can. Ah, coffee's pretty good, too. Oh, yay! Alright, gods of the north. Uh, deal with Dragonoff. I don't want to deal with Dragonoff. The new Russian army looks really good. Army professionals begin to rapidly improve. Let's try to max that out as fast as possible. Inspect the Zeltalus weaponry. Dragon Dragonov has brought a great deal of Zeltalus weapons into the district's possession. Most of the arms from our stockpile were just older models from the Soviet German war before. Some, however, are newer, more advanced designs that we that were put into production as recently as the last few months. These newer guns should be sent to the design bureau so that we might take advantage of Dragonov's technological advancements and employ them for our own gain. Absolutely. What is taking so long here? No, oh, they're not even showing up. That's why. Yes, more organization, please, please. I love organization. It's one of the most important stats you could possibly get in the game. Oh, and we have that. Good, good. And we have 0.77 a day. Not too shabby, my friends. Now, people might want to raid us, but I'm kind of okay with that. The least path of least bloodshed. Follow it up with, make improvements. Hey, if you want to do that, please go ahead. Specialized arms. We'll probably really do this one. It hurts our production cost, but we get a lot more reliability, which is pretty nice. The Raganov's armaments are certainly impressive pieces of gunsmithing, but no gun is perfect. Our scientists and the design bureau have come up with a list of improvements that they would like to make on Dragonov's designs, as well as a number of completely original designs based off of the technological technology discovered in Zlatas' arms. Testing on these new experimental designs has already begun, and it should be long before Svedlovsk is producing weapons of similar, if not superior, caliber to even the best within Russia. Very good, my friends. Continue training if you need it. Let's build new schools this time. Because that's going up. Uh, everything's going up anyway, so. Nice, nice, nice. I love beating up on enemies. And I wonder when they're going to attack us. I really do wonder when. 
That definitely helped our guns. Artillery is not looking too bad either. Anti-tank is worrying me a little bit, but eh, we'll see. Hey, we just finished up a Civvy 2. Not bad. Oh, and there goes Speer. I still have to play Spear. I'm literally, at the time of this recording, I'm still waiting for Toolbox here to come out, and just my gosh. That Spear is going to be one of the First Nations I play as, so. We'll make improvements first. Oh, there you go, Mexico. Followed up with specialized arms. Over the course of military history, one principle that the world has seen validated time and time again is the notion that as technology progresses, so too does specialization in the military. In the Middle Ages, this meant the development of heavily armored knights in battle. During the Napoleonic Wars, this was the revolutionary use of artillery by Napoleon. Today, it is the use of anti-tank weaponry, anti-air weapons, compact, uh, compact, compact tank weaponry, and so on. If the district's armies to remain a viable fighting force, capable of possibly one day taking on the German army, it is essential that we stay current with the new trends of warfare with another division. Is another horse? No, it's an infantry, which is totally, totally okay with me. Cool. And we're going to scavenge for loot. Keep scavenging. This is great. I love this so far. Ah, Goring is gone. Very... Wait. Wait, hold on. Okay, so I, first, I thought Hadrius was still alive, but the bald man won. Man, why can't there be a fifth contender for the throne of Germany? But, combined arms operations. Uh, among the deadliest lessons learned in this WW2, there were the principles of brutal efficiency of mechanized warfare. While our infantry are well trained and equipped, they lack the speed and power that tank divisions can provide on the modern battlefield, and thus fail to contend in any meaningful way with armor. Developing armor corps is of vital importance if we wish to protect Svedlosk, and eventually compete with other powers in the reunification of... Our homeland! Alright everyone, so here we're at, we're doing new weapons materials. Our scientists down at the design bureau have finished up with some new designs. They're taking advance, advantage of the new composite materials developed in the past few years. This has not only had the effect of making our armaments lighter and easier for soldiers to carry into battle, but has actually also increased the reliability of the weapons using these materials. We will see to it that these new designs and materials are put into the production immediately. And also right now, two men and Omsk have decided to kill each other, so... I'm okay with that. 40 divisions versus 5 to 11. I kind of hope two men wins because they have fewer divisions, but Omsk might win. That wouldn't be very good for us, but the new Russian army. All the work we put into our army has finally paid off. Svedlovsk now possesses a military of the modern age. Ours is a highly trained, well-equipped, and strategically oriented fighting force with special capabilities in armor and in armor corps. With such a powerful army at our front and growing industry behind us, reuniting Russia under our banner is not only possible, but certain. We get more attack training speed, or no, attack training, more division training time. More planning speed and terrain penalty reduction, and remove specialized defense. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, hold on. We lose five. It's only five percent, but army professionals. I think we can risk it. Let's do that. Let's go. Go as fast as we possibly can, and we can do this stuff. But we'll do this one at least because we get more organization. Also, the last focus we completed right before the fade and fade out, we actually got this tank division too. So. Really nice. It's not too bad. If we just double it, it'll be more than fine for us. So, totally fine with us. Even though I still want to beat up Yugra. But after this one, draw out the plans. Oh, we go to four-year four draft. That's not bad. We've had plans for the conquest of, or integration of several of our neighbors for years, but the constant bombing raids by the Luftwaffe prevented us from organizing enough to actually act on these plans. These plans include infiltrating our neighbors' armies, reaching out to resistance organizations in their territories, and more invasion strategies than could be counted. Now the state reorganized and our military rejuvenated. The wind is at our back. It is time to revisit these plans, possibly expand on them, and finally execute them. We lose stability wars for construction speed, a whole bunch of stuff. We get more manpower, and even more manpower, which is probably the most important thing we can get right now. Because we will need more. Operation Blue. Team Men. Operation Black. Operation Orange. Operation Red. Vorkuta. As a neighbor. Yugra. I kind of want to do them as fast as possible. Even though I do want to do Operation Black to kill them as fast as possible as well. Weekly War Spell goes down by 5% for 60 days. I'll deal with Novus Abisk. Decapitate the monster. Well, maybe Operation Orange? No. Well... Hmm. As far as going on the offensive goes, we are limiting, limited to striking either north or south for now. To the north, remnants of Bukharin's gulag system dot the snowy countryside, derelict, abandoned, emptied. It seems the cabal of ex-inmates, rapists, thieves, and murders have set up a partially functioning government out of their stronghold of Yugorsk. We must free the people of Yugura, Russian and native alike, from the criminal tyranny. We shall draw plans for an attack on Yugur at once. Uh, we'll do that eventually, but we'll also do Operation Black. 
Omsk, the Black League, Dmitry Yazov, they are all one and the same. Karbyshev was a broken man, pushed past the edges of sane thought by Nazi torture, but he was also old and increasingly senile. Yazov is different. He is younger, sharper, and smarter. His insanity makes him even more dangerous than his deceased master. Now, Omsk is the biggest challenge to our continued survival in Western Siberia, and must be dealt with before Yazov's crusade for revenge kills us all. Now, we might want to do them first just because they are at war, and they're going to be really kind of strong, so... I think it'd probably be best to do them first. But the four operations, once we get some more research first. Um, we could grab even more anti-tank. Let's grab this. Germany's indiscriminate terror bombing campaign was also a terrible crime against the Russian people. However, it was also effective in achieving our goal. With the constant threat of airborne annihilation, our armies were unable to undertake any significant maneuvers in their industry capacity or industrial capacity to which war was severely limited. In essence, Germany kept Russia from unifying. During that time, the Stavka was forced to sit on its hands and drop countless variations of hypothetical plans for attacking our neighbors when the plans inevitably stopped coming. Now, the time has come to put these plans into use. After discarding the outdated, unnecessary, or outright fantastic fantastical plans we are left with four operations each having to do with one of our neighbors to the north operations orange and red will crush the bandits of ugra and nkvd holdouts in Vorkuta, respectively to the south operation blue will end kaganovich's reign of terror and operation black will bring down the black league in omsk we may strike in either direction first but it should be noted that two men in omsk will eventually attack us on their terms if we do not strike them first sabers up for two men oh we can do this immediately deal with the bandits first Ooh, i don't know about that Hopefully, two men can hold out before we can launch an invasion into their territory first. Rokosovsky. Um, I'm going to go this one, probably. Oh, screw it. We'll just go that way. We do have tanks. So, actually, I didn't realize we just get Operation Blue done immediately. Ban is first. Operation Orange. Um, We get the same amount of stuff here. I don't... I kind of want to do Yuga first, just because they won't attack us. But at the same time, I want to wait to do them, because they won't attack us at all. And we can still raid and loot them, if possibly, to get free loot. So... Sabres out for two men. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Bingo, bongo, dingo, dongo. Withdraw our agents. Oh, look at that. Order 241. Supreme Command of the Ural Military District. 24A, Prospect Lenina Svedlovsk. Order number 241 in the West Siberian People's Republic of Tumen. All available formations of the Third Army, as well as any ancillary formations, are to be deployed against the Western Siberian People's Republic. The Third Army's general direction is as follows. Specially formed units are to penetrate enemy defensive lines and establish and maintain bridgeheads across the Iset and Mias rivers. Two, once supply lines are under no threat from enemy encirclement, the mass of available forces are to engage the military or enemy in pitched battle. Three, enemy forces capable of giving battle will be destroyed. Four, the enemy is to be pursued until all formations are destroyed and controls established over all territories of the Western Siberian People's Republic. All preparations made by and for the Third Army are to be reported to the Supreme Command of the Ural Military District, signed Konstantin Rokosovsky, Six Semper Evelo Motim Tyrannis. Very good. I'm still taking Omsk first. Because they're doing very... Oh, too well. They're doing too well now. I hope you get a lot of resistance. Hey, if you want to about that, please go right ahead. If you want to read about this, please go ahead as well. And then if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Now nah, it's going to be a little more difficult. God dang it. Why can't two men hold harder? Actually, how strong are these guys? 5 to 11. Uh, oh, they're out of manpower, so we might actually want to do it. They're, they're going to be coring this stuff anyways, but still. You never know. With them, if they core this, that makes them quite stronger. Quite a bit stronger, which is not good for us. Can't do anything yet. Prepare raid. I want to attack immediately, maybe. We'll see. We might not be able to do well. Yeah, they're looking a little weak right there, which is nice. I refuse to continue. Go in. Go in. Go in. Operation Black. A promise. A better life. Uh, let's do a deal with Nova Sibirsk. Since the Black League is such an unanimously monstrous foe, we may be able to garner military support from the nearby warlords. The first name that comes to mind is Novosibirsk. They share many of our political processes and have a somewhat similar vision for a reunited Russia, especially when it comes to the military's role in politics. Additionally, when they border, with, they share a border with Omsk. We should cut a deal with them. They provide some light artillery barrages to distract Yazov, and we strike while his head is turned and crush the Black League once and for all. Equipment? Very good. Operation Black, order 270. Supreme Command of the Ural Military District. Uh, let's see. All available formations for the Third Army, as well as any ancillary formations, are to be deployed against the all-Russian Black League government in Omsk. The Third Army's general direction is as follows. 1. Forces are to advance along the Ersia River, the to Tobolsk Front along the East Bank, and the Ishim Front along the West. Enemy forces capable of giving battle will be destroyed. 
Three, the city of Omsk will be enveloped by motorized formations in order to prevent the escape of enemy forces. Four, Omsk will be occupied and the Black League disbanded. All preparations made for and by the Third Army are to be reported to the Supreme Com Command of the Ural Military District. Only one such threat to the success of this operation is radicalism and the citizenry. Terrorist attacks may slow or even endanger the offensive. In any such cases, extremists will be apprehended alive when possible and imprisoned. Counter-extremism operations will focus on an order, preventing attacks, detecting threats, denying suspected threats any means of conducting attacks and defeating attacks should they occur. Rehabilitating and de-radicalizing prisoners will be of the utmost of priority in order to facilitate the pacification of Omsk. Signed, Konstantin Rokosovsky. Rokosovsky. Will it be enough? Probably not. Probably, honestly, not enough. And the relics of the past. There you go. If you want to read about that, please read it. Promise a better life. We don't know much about Omsk. Nobody does. Spies that don't go in don't come out. The only thing that does is repetitive propaganda. What we do know is that Omsk is a society carefully crafted and maintained in preparation for a war unlike any war that's ever been fought. It is wholly totalitarian and we can use that against them. By broadcasting the message across the border, we can reach the people of Omsk and promise them a better life. One free from the omnipresent and omnipotent oppressor of the Black League. Maybe the Russians? Oh, support from the Federation. Uh, stability and civilian factory? Nice! Our envoy to Novosibirsk has sent us good news. The Federation has recognized the threat the League possesses and promises to support us in the coming conflict. President Pokrishkin himself has given the guarantee. In the event of a war, the forces of the Federation of Novosibirsk and Altai will mobilize along the border with the League as if preparing for a full-scale offensive. This distraction, they uncouple with preparatory bar barrages from the heavy guns, shall hopefully fool the League into diverting forces away from the main front against us, giving us the edge we need to triumph over the mad dudes in Omsk. In war, every advantage counts. Um, with here, it's not too bad. I like that they have one division here, too. We can probably cut down through here, destroy these guys, take two men for ourselves. Which wouldn't be too bad. And then, decapitate the monster. To discredit Omsk as a threat to all of Russia is to ignore the apocalyptic insanity and stupidity that is the cornerstone of their ideology. Nothing about what they believe in is hyperbole. Not with Omsk, such as it is. The responsibility to defeat them falls to us, and we shall not fall. You have to be peace probably for this one, right? Uh, oh, hello. Yep, Omsk is saying not today. I should... Eh, we'll go to war then. That's fine. Let's go! Black League influence too low? Black League infiltrators and sympathizers have plagued our nation for years, undermining the stability of our government and sowing the seeds of our defeat at the inexorable war with Omsk. We only started gaining ground on them recently with the formation of the Internal Security Bureau, but many fear that our best efforts would not be enough now. The war's finally begun and the infiltrators have played their hand. The tireless vigilance of the ISB has decimated the influence of the Black League within our territory. Incidents of sabotage or terrorism are sporadic and rare. Few involve more than five insurgents, and even fewer cause meaningful or even noticeable harm to our war effort. With the streets free of terrorists, we can focus all of our efforts on defeating Yazov once and for all. Our enemies lie on the other side of a bayonet. Ancient o Operation Orange, very good. Your goal is a rush down south ASAP, and you're, you are there to support. Everyone else, hold the line, hold the line. Because these three divisions must die. You might actually head down here too, just in case. Ah! We wish you strike, huh? Good. Now, they might be coming in here as well, so you're going to attack as well. And you're going to support the attack. Good. Come on, horses. Yes, you've done it. You help support the attack here too. All that matters is you guys hold the line here. Hold the line. They're starting to attack us, which is good, good, good. Uh, you begin... I don't want to get ourselves in circles, so... You guys are... Oh, help out right here. Good. Once we win here, that'll be good. And you guys begin doing this, and this, and that. Move around if you can, please, please, please. Move quick, 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 quick. Get in. And we've encircled quite a few guys already, which is great, great, great. They're starting to attack us as well. Oh, you guys hold and retreat. Or die. Okay, then. We have one guy encircled. You guys help out right here. The faster you can kill these divisions off, the faster we will be doing very, very well. Head right here. Head right here. Actually, I need the cavalry to come right here, too. Because we need to rescue you guys as fast as possible. That'll be good. Yeah, how are they not dead yet? With three divisions attacking, I don't understand how they're not dead. Uh, you guys go down here. Keep them in place. Good, good, good. 
Guys, go over here. We need you now, 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 now. And so, fear in the ranks. The bandits of Yugra are little more than a disorderly band of criminals, and the criminals are all the same. There's no honor among thieves, no loyalty. They act like they are the most powerful men in Russia, but when it comes to time to back that up that claim, they run like wild dogs. All we have to do is perform some simple exercises on the border and fly some planes over the cities, and their troops will be too petrified of our military power to mount any sort of resistance. Hopefully. Operation Orange. Um, go right here if you can. And you guys go there. You guys help out right there. If you can get to here and there, you guys will do fine. Hold for now and don't die. You guys head down there and don't die as well. Oda 212 on the thief territory of Yugra. All design formations of the Third Army, as well as any auxiliary formations, are to be deployed against a territory controlled by the bandit state of Yugra. The Third Army's general direction is as follows. 1. All units are to advance along the entire front in a single line as to prevent any small squads of bandits from bypassing our assault. 2. Enemy militias who choose to resist will be destroyed without support. 3. Enemy militias who surrender will be disarmed and all their members arrested. 4. All formations will converge on the bandits' principal fortification, Yugorsk, from the south and east and eliminate any organized resistance. <clears throat> Any enemy militias that survive their encounter with our forces are unlikely to be able to give battle. It will all in likelihood be unnecessary to pursue the enemy north of the Savinyara Slizva River. However, such an action may become necessary should our enemy flee northward and with significant amounts of contraband. Our air wings will attempt to prevent such a withdrawal from happening by destroying any organized unit they can find. All preparations made by and for the Third Army to be reported to the Supreme Command of the Ural Military District, Sign Konstantin Rozhevsky, or not Rozhevsky, Rokosovsky. Yaba Izolania wanted dead or alive, and I forgot about planes. We did have a few planes here. You know what? Let's use some interceptors until they all die. Bombers, yes. And you guys as well. I forgot about these. It's not going to make a massive difference, but hopefully it'll make a difference. No matter what. Good. Because we need to rescue that guy. If that guy dies, it is what it is. If these guys survive, that would be great. Good. Keep it up. You guys are getting... And we freed them. Go. Everyone go. Go, go, go. You guys are going to go straight towards Omsk. Up here, we're, all I want to do is keep them in place. That's all I want to do. Keep going, going, going. We just need a distraction. Cornwall's gone. Hey, if you want to about that, please go right ahead. Great. Go in, go in. Got the plant. Awesome. And Omsk is almost ours. Omsk is ours. And where's the next capital? They don't have an ex-capital. That was actually a lot easier than I thought it would be. I'll be honest, that was a lot easier. But, let's go core the stuff. Great, great, great. Sophia, and then, uh, Operation Red. We're not a neighbor of them, so we got this one. Clear the bandits. Yugur stands in the way of reunifying the Western Euros. There will be no compromise, either. There can be no compromise, not with Vori. They live to hoard wealth like the Tsars of old and plunder the same innocent people that we strive to protect. These disorganized bandits should stand no chance against their well-oiled war machine. We must meet these bandits with the full force of the Third Army and bring them to justice for their crimes. And we have another division. Alright, so we're done here. I want to continue improving yourselves. We already got all the research speed. It is already 1965, so Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. And we have a 10th division. Alright, so we're done with cavalry. We're continue making more infantry from here on out. And we might upgrade these guys too. With them capitulating. We got a lot more tanks. Look at that. Artillery is great. Guns are great. Motorized are bueno, bueno, bueno. If that's the okay, case, let's improve these guys then. Five. And we'll go with six arino. Uh, well, I guess four. Four and six, right? That's how we do it. Nice. Good stuff. Good stuff. Make sure they got support art. Make sure they got engineers. Make sure they got some recon on them. Now that's a good tank division. Oh. Oh, we can raid these guys too? Oh, we might want to do that as well. They have no manpower. Yeah, actually, let's... Ooh. Ah, clear the bandits. Oh, actually, we're not quite ready for these guys yet. Um, you know what? We'll be okay, though. Just go on. Just go on. We'll be fine. And actually, do we tell them to engage? Yes, we did. They're looking really bad. I'm not too worried about that. The internal enemies, a deal with Dragunov. The pen may be mightier than the soul, but nobody said anything about the automatic rifles. Our soldiers need weapons and lots of them, more than an our anemic arms industry is capable of producing or sustaining. Luckily, there is a second solution to solving our deficit. To our immediate west, Comrade Dragunov sits atop of what is effectively a city-sized arms plant in Zatost. We must draw upon plans to purchase arms from this merchant of death as soon as possible. Mm, better trucks. Scavenge for loot? Well, why not? We have one loot anyway, so might as well. We want to get these guys pretty quickly. And we'll do well, and then we'll raid these guys down here too. Magnigorsk. Zotaus provides mercenaries. Uh, uh, if you want to about this, please go ahead. I think this happens every time. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's really 
Yeah, I don't think this is anything special here, so the help is appreciated. For now. Guarantee for arms? There's no compromise with these pieces of garbage. We have Gandhi Dragunov is not a stupid man, though he is not terribly principled. He values one thing, profit. Every other semblance of morality is of secondary importance. He does not care about our ambitions to reunite Russia. He may even be opposed to a united Russian state on the grounds that it would be bad for his little gun-running operation. If he's not concerned with the goals, then we are not concerned for the safety of his little fife. We will pay him a sh for a shipment of arms, nothing less and nothing more. The Third Army does not bleed for the ambivalent. A guarantee for arms, no guarantee needed. Followed up with the Guardians of the Sky. The Free Aviators remain one of the most effective air forces in all of Russia, certainly in Western Siberia. Becoming their ally or even integrating their military forces into our own could provide us with numerous benefits, along with which would include the prestige of being the nation that received the endorsement of the Free Aviators. Maintaining good relations with the Free Aviators must then be a top priority for Svedlovsk and its foreign relations goals. To that end, opening up diplomatic relations and sending an offer of industrial assistance could help begin bringing our nation closer to theirs. Very good. Keep going, everyone. Oh, wait. No wonder you guys aren't doing it, going up there. I didn't give you orders to. I'll have our two divisions up here. That kind of sucks. Go up there first, and then go there. There you go. You'll be fine. You will be okay. Everything's going up pretty nicely, actually, already. To, uh, we might do research facilities. Yeah, maybe. Eh, agriculture is better. Nice, there you go. Kill them all. We'll be fine. I'm not too worried about it. Alright, two men in Omsk are very good to integrate. And then... An expanded deal? Ah, oh, let's do road to Surgut. The goal of integrating the free aviators into Svedlosk will require more than kind words and minor industrial assistance. Years of aerial combat with the Germany over and over around free aviator territory has inflicted major damage on the infrastructure that once reconnected Surgut to the rest of Russia. Many of the roads and rail lines affected ran through Svedlosk just as well as Surgut. Rebuilding these connections would benefit us and could help us bring into good favor with the aviators. <sighs> We're looking quite good. Get some more of that then. And get some more of this and this. Beautiful, my friends. Batov is not too bad. I like him as a general. Yes. Very good. You guys just go straight up to Novi Port. And you guys head to there. That's fine. They'll do fine. I'm just not worried. We're going to close out of this because we're okay. We're going to keep this one open too because we do need to do this one. So we need pretty much everywhere else. And then send workers to the north. Uh, Surgut's lifeblood is in its oil reserves. Most nations in this region purchase oil from Surgut supply, and demand for the black gold is ever increasing. Svedlovsk oil demand has increased steadily as the reunification campaigns have, pro has progressed, and this trend is bound to continue as we begin to deploy motorized and armored divisions. Despite that Surgut has struggled to capitalize on the situation and increase output, the biggest limiting factor for Surgut appears to be the manpower available to extract the resource. By offering the services of our own workers and engineers, we might be able to boost oil output for our own consumption and improve the relations with the free aviators. Great! Great, and I do apologize for reading very, very fast. This coffee and just me, I'm excited for this campaign, so it is what it is. But we might have to do Operation Red. With Yuga under, under, under control, we may not push further north into the same frozen work camps that Vori came from. What remains of the Gulag's guards have flocked to Vasily Blokin's banner, who rules to this day with the same iron fist that he used to snuff out countless thousands of lives back when he worked for the NKVD. We shall draw plans for an attack on Vorkuta at once. Actually, since we're here, I'm going to begin doing this one anyways. It doesn't matter to me. Good. 15. Not bad. Hey, we defeated them. Nice. And let's go and core their territory. Beautiful. And, um... I wonder if we can raid these guys, actually, maybe. That would be kind of nice. Or we do it against Vorkuta. Yes. Maybe more loot? Yes, please. An expanded deal. Oh, well, actually, we need that one too first. But this one should go by pretty darn quickly. We got, what, three days left? Not bad. And we're still mobilizing. The Siberian Black Army defeated the Novosibirsk region. Wow, look at that. A turn that few anticipated. An expanded deal. While the free aviators had been entirely successful in their effort to rebuild a decent air force, their focus on the military has put a large strain on Surgut's economy. Many basic necessities, like coal, bread, and warm clothing, can be difficult to come by. Medical supplies, like gauze, are almost non-existent in the country. Svedlovsk, is compa by comparison, is in a much more stable position, and can afford to send surplus supplies to their neighbors in the north. Doing so would go a long way towards winning the hearts of the people in Surgut. Very true. Let's go in, boys. And girls. They refuse tribute. Ah, oh, very good. Thank you for refusing tribute. Operation Red. Red successful. Seize all we can. And Order 303. 
All available formations of the Third Army, as well as any ancillary formations, are to be deployed against the Forkuta Corrective Labor Camp. The Third Army's general direction is as follows. 1. The Northern Front is to advance until all enemy presence south of the Usa River is defeated by the way of being destroyed. Bridgeheads, 2. Across the Usa will be captured and established. 3. Once supply lines are under no threat from enemy encirclement, a thing single thrust towards Varkuta will force enemy formations out of the city and into the Vukulag area. 4. NKVD presence will be wiped out and the Department of Labor Colonies of the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs, SIC, will be dissolved in perpetuity. All preparations made by and for the Third Army are to be reported to the Supreme Command of the Ural Military District, signed Konstantin Rokosovsky. The blood on the snow drips from his hands. Very good. And at this point, I'm going to convert these guys to these guys. The treasure. Beautiful. Oh, that's a lot of peepee. -pee. Oh, we love the peepee. -pee. Actually, what divisions have we want? I think we want all of these guys, right? That's not too bad with this. We're going to go and take this one off and replace it with military police next, maybe. Um, Suppression. Yeah, well, let's just replace it with military police next time. Oh, we'll have to use support equipment anyways for garrison, so let's just switch it around to this one. Thank you. So it doesn't cost us anti-tank, so we need less production somewhat to a degree, because... Eh, actually, infantry equipment is okay. If we need to go in, just go in when we need to. And offer sur for surrender. Blokin seems to have no grand vision for Russia. He has no ideological commitments, not even to the West Russian Siberian or West Russian Revolutionary Front. Knowing this, perhaps we can be reasoned with. He may surrender his territories to us if we promise him a high level position in our administration. Even those free societies still need jailers. Scavenge for loot? Uh, we have one loot. I suppose we could try. And an offer for integration. Oh, look at that. Oh, they do not exist. Oh, well. Well, I should have done that one earlier. The devil garnered. Well, if you wonder about this, please guard ahead. Well, actually, if you wonder about this one, please guard ahead. That's my fault. Always false, so. The devil cornered. When the bombings ended, many of Svedlovsk were unsure as to the military district's position in the new post Lvov Alpha age for Russia. It has become apparent now that Svedlovsk stands among the strongest powers in Russia, having taken both out Omsk and Tumen, two of the strongest warlords in Western Russia. This is, there's no time to rest under laurels, however. There remains threats to Svedlovsk still. Zlatals is one such threat. Their arms trade is pumping high-quality weapons directly into the hands of those who would have destroyed us. That said, Zlatals has an extremely well-equipped military and a bank with which to hire endless mercenaries. Conquering the small nation could end up forcing us to expand far more resources than we can afford. Consequently, it might be beneficial to give an offer of integration before authorizing military action against the Taoist. But, Blokin stands firm. In a puzzling display of defiance, Blokin has refused our offer for surrender. Perhaps his lost power has finally driven him off the edge of sane thought. Perhaps he was paranoid. He thought, he thought our offer was too good to be true. Heck, maybe he just didn't like the idea of answering to someone else again after all these years. Regardless, it is a shame that he would rather subject his men into the freezing cold and certain defeat by our superior forces than see reason. There's a silver lining. Now we can drop any pretense of giving Blokin a chance to redeem himself and prosecute him like the mass murderer he is. No matter. No matter. It is what it is. And we have to do this one next. Cut him down. For one foolish reason or another, Blokin refuses to go quietly. All the better for us in the long run. Mass murders like him deserve no place in the new Russia, let alone in a government. His men are nothing more than pr prison guards with inflated egos. They cannot stand to the Third Army. We shall strike his name in Vorkuta from the history books with ease. Followed up with... Reinstating region-wide administration. Which we can't do because we need... Uh, Vorkuta. At long last, victory is ours. All organized threats to our rule have been vanquished. One flag flies over Western Siberia, a land free from tyrant and brigand alike. alike. The reunification of Russia shall soon be within a grasp, but for now, we have more pressing concerns. Our conquests are impressive, but also expansive. Even with the Third Army stretched as thin as it is, vast stretches of the land in their periphery have become wasteless, lawless wastes, power vacuums waiting for the next Yazov or Kaganovich to fill it. We must assert our administration's rule in these areas before we lose control of them. And we'll go back down to two-year draft. Okay, that's not too bad. Sweet victory, slightly decreased scoring times, but we have another division that we can have. Oh, beautiful. Twelve divisions is not too shabby, but we also do the internal enemies. Subversives inside Svedlovsk pose just as much of a threat to our nation as enemy soldiers standing in our borders do. Thus far, our failure to contain them has led to a disheartened army, and with a significantly high desertion rate as well as the consistent leaking of state secrets into the Black League. We must identify who within the state possesses a threat to our country, if we're to end these disruptive forces. If we do not end these threats from within, then we should be surely conquered by the threats without. Yeah, this is not going to take very long to do this part. Ah, and there goes the Poles. Good job, Kazakhstan. Good job. Good job. Nice. Who can we raid? Oh, Cap Gulag's captured. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Good. 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 Pakistan becomes independent. Very nice. Good job, Pakistan. We need more anti-tank, which makes sense. 
Offer to integrate. Oh, we can offer to integrate them? Oh, there we go. So the 588th Night Bomber Regiment, otherwise known as the Night Witches or the Free Aviators, are heroes through and through. They serve the motherland with not only dignity, but valor during the Great Patriotic War and have continued to do so since arranging sorties against the Nazi bombers from their main base in Surakut. We've always had a special relationship with the aviators due to our shared ties with the Soviet armed forces, and to integrating the aviators into our nation will not only further our control over Western Siberia, but grant us access to their ex expertise in aerial combat, not to mention their bomber wings. Oh, we just automatically complete that focus. That's kind of nice. And the double corner, too. We can double two. An offer for integration. Our agreement with Sir Good is a symbiotic one, forged from years of close cooperation and mutual respect. Now the situation in Western Siberia is stabilizing. The time has come to ca carve the bomb between the 3rd Army and the 588th Night Bomber Regiment into a stone. We shall send an offer to Surgut to formally integrate their territory into the district. This is a logical culmination of our mutual cooperation. Both both of our nations will gain from the latter's integration. We will have unfettered access to the air wings with which we may coordinate sorties against enemy forces while they have well, full access to the resources of Svedlusk proper, which then they can provide for the con constituents, a win-win situation, and the cancer within. Our borders remain porous and infiltrators from both Tumen and Omsk slither through every unpatrol gap. They damage infrastructure vital to our internal trade system. They turn civilians and military personnel against us with propaganda and rhetoric not actual truth. Revisionist partisans damage our military facilities and assist the enemy during raids in order to weaken us for Kaganovich's inexorable attack. Black League operatives are far more antisocial, launching car bombs and IED attacks. They also engage in full-blown sh shootouts with local garrisons. These elements are a threat to our nation and its people must be dealt with at once. Something must be done about this? Well, we'll see. We're looking not too bad. Free aviators, please. They accept. As we expected, the free aviators have accepted our offer for integration. Trucks faring in the city's new garrison were cheered by the local inhabitants. And Bershanskaya and the rest of the Night Witches were awarded their long to hero of the Soviet Union medals by Marshal Orkosovsky himself in a public ceremony in 1905 Square. The integration of the Sugut marks the first piece of Russia outside of Svedlovsk to fall under our control and it will not be the last. Already, the aviators are providing themselves to be, to be valuable allies in our plight. They promise to kickstart our Air Force by sharing their wealth of knowledge in regarding aerial combat and give our aviation industry the boost it deserves. With them on our side, our dominance of the skies all but assured. Milosinia Vimesta. We get a free core. That's awesome. I love it. And now let's do research facilities. Yes, please. Can we raid people? I'd love to raid them. That actually worked out a lot better than I thought it would. Double cornered. And then, uh, we can do this stuff up north. We still need to do this one too, so. And then Sandy of Yazov. We get more political power. Uh, Revisionist Influence Annihilated. Um, this is the Tyranny of Kaganovich. After the... Uh, actually, let's read this one, uh, about this one first. I'll read this one. Yeah, if, if you want to read this one again, please go right ahead. But I do want to read about getting rid of uh, both these guys, but I don't like Kaganovich. After Russia's failure in the war against Germany, many in Western Siberia turned to Lazar Kaganovich and the West Siberian People's Re Republic to succeed where Bukharin's USSR failed. Despite the collapse and eventual disillusion of the West Siberian People's Republic, Kaganovich is seen by a large portion of the population as the rightful leader. Practically, this has led to many in the army deserting and many more simply avoiding military service. Letting this dangerous notion of loyalty towards Kaganovich fester within the nation and create further discontent among the people will exacerbate the severity of the problems greatly in the future. It is vital that these Kaganovich sympathizers are dis discovered and eliminated. There are Golden Republic bends a knee. Even the motion of death. Has some common sense. Dragunov has widely accepted our offer for the immediate and peaceful integration of Zlatas into the district. Our forces are moving into secure territory, and already Third Army engineers are working on plans to expand the state's surprisingly well-kept infrastructure system to allow better access to the rest of the district. All of this is not to detract from the many benefits that Zlatas offers us. We have now access to his riches. The Dragunov and Kalashnikovs, expertise in designing weapons, the facilities they use to build them, and access to the stockpiles they have lying in wait, and all without having to shed a single drop of blood on the rocky slopes of the Urals. A tremendous victory, to be sure. Ah, oh, we captured our plan. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Oh my goodness. Uh, these guys are 16 combo with, which is not too bad. These mercenaries are 16 combo with. I'm going to convert these guys to this type of division, but these two will be converted to tanks. Let's shove them all in. And, uh, where do I put you guys? Can I trade? Can I raid you guys? That'd be kind of nice, actually. Can we raid anybody? Ooh. Siberian Free Territory. Ooh, they actually might be a little bit difficult to raid. We could try it, I guess. Your old district, they have no loot, and Kazakhstan has no loot either, so. And before we finish everything else here, let's do Kaganovich. Sweet victory. Our mission to reunite the Western Siberian lands has been completed. Th through our army, we have cleansed the Urals of various warlords and challengers. The tyrants of Tumen and reactionaries of Omsk have been defeated and we remain the lone victor. General Rokos 
Rokosovsky will be forever remembered as a hero of the motherland. We must not also forget those who died sacrificing their lives for the unification of West Siberia. Now, as our jubilant soldiers celebrate, we must begin the reconstruction and integration of our new lands. The people of the Urals have new hope for the future as an army parades through the streets of Svetlovsk. The people do not want to live as they did under the chaos, under the warlord era ever again. We cannot make the same mistakes other the West Siberian People's Republic made ten years ago. A trustworthy general like Rokosovsky must lead Russia, not a corrupt tyrant like Kaganovich or madman like Yazov. A new generation must rise and take Russia onto a different path. Modernizations and reforms will be needed, and we need powerful leadership to gather strength for the wars to come. But now we can celebrate our victory in a new path for Russia. Let the people feel the joy that they have not felt in thirty years. We must proclaim our victory to the world. Um, I like the decryption of the combat. We can always create an intelligence agency later, so if you want to do about that, please go ahead. Recon groups. Protecting the state from those who would steal our secrets and provoke rebellion in our lands is certainly an important function, but to do such things to others will be equally valuable. The new security bureau will be equipped with a department dedicated to offensive missions with, as infiltration, extraction, and espionage. These recon groups, as they are to be referred to officially, will perform cross-border weapon smuggling, intelligence gathering operations, and assassination should we need them. And revisionist influences annihilated. Great. Owing to the tireless efforts of the ISB, Fabrich Fabrichnikov has reported that revisionist influence within our territory has reached an absolute nadir. He attributes our success to the three factors education about tyranny inherent to Kaganovich and Stalinist thought, the relatively high standard of living in our efforts to, dis to encourage the population to remain optimistic and steadfast. Working in conjunction, these factors have made Kaganovich's theories unappealing to the average citizen, he claims. We have successfully beaten back the claws closing around us, but the beast still remains. Now that there is no risk of an uprising or attempted revolution, we can dedicate more time and resources to bring out Gaganovich's regime and truly freeing the people of Russia. Onwards! Oh, and we integrate them too. We can try a raid. I mean, that might work maybe, but knowledge is everything. Part of the functions of the new security bureau will be its ability to retrieve information and decrypt it. A committee has been put together consisting of former Soviet spies, NKVD officers, and codebreakers which will begin recruiting those considered to have the necessary skills to work for the internal security bureau. Already dozens of spies are being trained secure locations across Svedlovsk. As junior codebreakers begin decrypting enemy communication, enemy communications and information soon, no secret anywhere in Russia will be hidden to us. This is going to cost us more, but... That is fine. Oh, we need this one too. Creating new security service. Dealing with these new threats will necessitate the creation of an agency designed to fight the spies and dis dissidents in a way that the brute force of the army cannot. An agency similar to that of the NKVD. The Internal Security Bureau will be charged with keeping track of state secrets, identifying troublesome agitators, and making sure that all who serve in the government are who they say they are and doing what the government asks of them. This organization will keep the state operational no matter the conditions. Give us your loot. Which I, I'm surprised they actually do have loot, so. I don't want to do this yet until we finish the focus tree, so. They refuse tribute. Alright, let's see what happens. Our division should be relatively okay as well. You're not great on an attack, but oh well. And we read that one. So we have four, five more to read. Wow, that is quite a bit. Ooh, equipment begins to improve. I might do this one first. Reincorporate their industry. Despite the large industrial base we are now in control of, much of it is either inert or destroyed. No doubt thanks to the scorched earth policies by our enemies. This presents us with two problems for the price of one. Not only are Omsk oil fields useless and Tiumen's heavy industrial centers non-functional, hampering our ability to further reunite Russia, but the workers of these areas are jobless and likely more hostile to our new administration. These vital economic locations must be rebuilt, re renovated, and reorganized at once. Yes. Yes. Many times yes. Treasure. Ah, a relic of the past. Beautiful. Basic motorized, work in the shadows. Happy 65, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. Industry. Arkady uh, Fabrichnikov's office was on the third floor of what he assumed had been an apartment building. It had been expropriated by the Third Army and made the HQ of the Internal Security Bureau, the agency he was now the leader of. One of the peculiarities of this building was that his office was the only one on the entire third floor. That's how he knew the posters were assigned. They were greasy with ink and wheat paste, and they all said the same thing in the thick black letters, the Black League, the rebirth of Russia. It didn't take him long to clear them off his door, but at the same time, he felt like he, he was being watched. Inside, he hung up his trench coat and papka, and sat behind his desk, cracking open the file the military compiled of seditious activity. It was thicker than his wrist, stuffed with a ARs, autopsy reports, eyewitness interviews, and samples of revisionist and league propaganda. Photographs of graffiti. Enemy agents were crawling all over the place, it seemed. Heck, they were even in. He heard a metal click from down the hall. Footsteps, rapid and purposeful. He tore open one of the drawers of the desk and pulled out his tokarov just as the door swung open. His would-be assassin jumped back in fright. Christ, it's just me! Eric, one of his assistants, said. Arkady sighed in relief and lowered his gun. Eric put on his ornate steel light lighter in his pocket and took a drag of a cigarette. Kolya and I were going out to get some drinks. Do you want to come? Arkady thought for a second, his eyes downcast as the file splayed out in front of him. No thanks, I got some work to do. 
still looting, raiding, and pillaging, sign us up. And like I said earlier, I do apologize for talking really fast. I just want to get through a lot of the stuff, which I'm actually really enjoying this campaign. It's a lot more fun than I thought it would. I thought this would be a lot more difficult, and it could be. It actually could be extremely difficult if two men and Omsk really just want to kill you off immediately. So, so far, I say we got a little bit lucky with the way things are running, so not too bad. Obviously, we could go to the next stage, but I want to get through all the focuses first. That's just like how I like to play. Getting through all the focuses, I think, would be really, really fun first. And, I, and maybe we can raid again. Oh, look at this. Nice, very good. <clears throat> we need more tanks. Way more tanks. And other than that, we're looking very fine. Very nice. Everything is knowledge. Good. And then connect rail networks. Yes, please. Between the terror bombings and the collapse of the West Siberian People's Republic, hundreds of kilometers of track were destroyed, left to decay, or cannibalized for war production. Well, the latter was never a good idea. We now have the opportunity to rebuild the railways in our nation, which will stimulate economic growth and facilitate troop movement. We should start by reconnecting the lines between Svedlovsk, Tumen, and Omsk. Followed up with... Probably an agent, but we don't need to do that yet. And force martial law. The city of two men in Omsk are ours, but so far their capture has been a sol solely symbolic vi victory. Holdouts of Kaganovich's and Yazov's followers still operate out of urban areas throughout the reconquered territories. They become a creeping, invisible cancer that must be excised before they consume us from within. To fight these terrorists, the cities must be locked down. If you'd like to buy better industrial equipment, please go right ahead. Some say that suspending civil law on habeas corpus was a betrayal of our ideals of liberty and freedom, but, in the face of men, no monsters, who will destroy everything we stand for in the blink of an eye, these detractors will fall silent soon enough for the greater good. Of course. Yelena? Yes, please. We love Mama Yelena. And? Equipment? Yes. Followed up with, promote heroes. Soldiering is a thankless job. Facing death and dismemberment day in and day out is stressful, physically taxing, and horrible for morale. Once a dragoon in the Imperial Army, Konstantin Rokosovsky knows this all too well. As opposed to idealizing the dead, we must instead focus on the brave sons of the Third Army, who are still alive, who fight for the betterment of all Russia. We must recognize our valiant soldiers for approving the merit in battle, and commend them for their heroism. Absolutely. Followed up with more technology, apparently. Awesome, awesome. We got that one done. Great, 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 great. And I might, I'll probably make these guys 40 combo by the off screen as well. But, one step closer. The deed is finally done. Inside and out, the Euro military district stands supreme, indivisible, and invincible. Now that our internal enemies have begun to put to rest, we can go about properly and fully reincorporating the newly retaken territories into a unified polity, strengthening our hold on the region. Ooh, Irkutsk won. There are still millions of square kilometers left to deliberate, and countless foes standing in our way. The road ahead is long. It shall be littered with the blood of tyrants and those brave soldiers who kill them alike. But for now, the hope of a greater, stronger Russia will ride with us. The men and women courageous enough to carry the flame into the darkness. For now... We are one step closer and heroes of the Soviet Union. The meeting hall was small but immaculately decorated. Banners bearing the standards of the various corps and divisions of the Third Army hung over the stage. The flags of the old Union and the district hung one from each side. The audience was divided into two sections, one for the guests, mostly military personnel, and one for the recipients. Sitting in the recipient section, Karel was a statue. Just like every other soldier was being promoted, on the inside, though, he felt like he was going to throw up. He could handle getting his commission. Junior Lieutenant Karel... Yablonsky sounded wonderfully wonderful to him, but the thought of finally meeting Marshal Rokosovsky face to face for all of Svedlovsky see made him made his stomach turn. He didn't know why. Korea was so deep in the thought he didn't almost hear his name being called. He smoothed out his uniform and tried not to shake too much as he walked on stage. Rokosovsky stood behind a podium with General Badtov and Bagranyan by his side. He smiled as Karel shook his hand, and then pinned the middle to Karel's chest and handed him his epaulets. Gold with one star and a single red line down the middle. Karel saluted as did Rokosovsky and spoke without thinking. Thank you, Marshal. Thank you for your service, comrade, he replied. Your hero zone brought you here. It's the least I could do. He turned back to the audience and congratulated the newly commissioned officers. The room erupted into a round of applause and Karel thought about all of the pain and torment he'd endured during his time with the Third Army for a long, shimmering moment. It was all worth it. The defenders of our liberty deserve their thanks. And I forgot about this song, which is probably bad for me. Whee! Hey, but we built a lot of roads. We built a... There's a lot of oil here. Wow. Beautiful. It's weird not seeing Omsk reunify Western Siberia. But that's okay with us. And I'll do one more focus before we end this longish episode. Oba Commando Sudwest Africa. Very cool. Very cool. 20 and 9. Sign us up. Yes, please. Now, we're not going to have enough anti-tank equipment or main battle tanks or really anything here when we get to the point where we need to be. Interceptors too, huh? One step closer. And that's it for now. In which, I guess we have no event. But form the West Siberian Military District. A new candidate for Russian dominate, domination has appeared. Very good. And, what's next? This one? Sure, why not? 
Warlord recruitment is now finito. Prepare for war. It has to be 69, I believe, first. Right? Yes, it does. Ah, and my favorite stuff. Poverty relief. Yes. Professionalism. Yes. Uh, agriculture. Ah, uh, this stuff could wait for now. Equipment. Oh, let's get this stuff too. Infrastructure. Ah, let's wait for that one. Oh, more poverty. Expand the welfare state. Yes, please. Political thoughts. Eh, that's okay. I like the infrastructure, but expertise and bonus to industry is super, super important. Let's come up here next to get some more infrastructure. Free infrastructure, basically. Uh, we get more stability, which would be bad. But, oh, get more construction speed. Uh, I'm going to grab the construction speed, actually. We can save this stuff for later, because we need to keep our PP. We can only get one a day. So... Do we not have another focus? Maybe get a few more days, and then the death of the Marshal. Oh no! Today is a bleak day of the district. Marshal Konstantin Rokosovsky passed away last night after a lengthy battle with prostate cancer. Oh! No doubt exacerbated by his many years of service and the harsh Siberian climate. His last words were, I've done all I can for now. Go on, let me rest. Rokosovsky was on one of the Soviet Union's finest journals, and he served the Russian people with distinction and pride. Even when all hope seemed lost during the long, brutal years of German terror bombing, he never stopped trying to save every life he could. And when the bombing ended, he led Svedlovsk. Uh, through, most of its, through its most turbulent years, yet leading the Third Army to victory against the armies of Kaganovich and Yazov. His successor is his close friend and personal side, General Pavel Batov, who claimed to the mantle of leadership is contested by none. He survived by his wife, Galina, and his two daughters, Ari Ariandina and Nadzenya. What? That sucks, he just dies. The moderate Suvorov. No! No! But we shall end this campaign. Not in the campaign. I keep saying that. The status of the district. After years of war, bombings, and bloodshed, it would appear that we have finally managed to unite Western Siberia under our rule. Once our last holdouts of warlords and ideological fanatics are flushed out, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Svedlovsk has been under military rule for years now, and this has served our interests well. The unstable nature of Russia at the time necessitated that the military be given priority in decision-making at the national level. However, Svedlovsk has already done what it set out to do. We've reunited a significant portion of Russia and brought our nation to the point where we're no longer under a constant threat of invasion. Democratic proponents argue that, in the light of the situation, it is time to begin transitioning into a democracy. The military argues that such measures are premature and that a position is not yet safe enough to allow for democracy. In order to style the matter, a referendum will be held on the matter. Will Svedlovsk become a democracy or not? And we get exactly 241 political power, which is weird. But if you enjoyed this video, please do consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know in the comments below how handsome you think Batov is. And I will see you tomorrow, as we'll see what happens and what else is in store for us with a third of a million manpower in reserve. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.